Hey everybody, welcome back to Not So Serious. My name is Tommy, and as always, I'm joined by Sam, Joe, and Michael. In today's episode, we decided we wanted to talk about our experiences as undergraduates in physics and astronomy at the University of Michigan. Hopefully, this gives a unique perspective on what it's like to be an undergraduate in the physics and astronomy fields. As always, if you have any topics that you'd like to see us discuss in a future episode, make sure to leave those in the comments down below. We'd be more than happy to cover those in a future episode of Not So Serious. As always, we hope you enjoy. Go. Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about what it's like being a physics or an astronomy major at, at the University of Michigan. So, um, to, so we're going to briefly talk about the, uh, the different classes that you have to take and the prerequisites that you have to take for that, the different options if you choose to major in either physics or on the astronomy and astrophysics side. Um, then we're going to talk about some of the, the upper levels, the elective classes you get to take, some of the more fun things. We're also going to talk about the different clubs, research opportunities that you get to, to join, the extracurriculars that you get to do at Michigan, mostly centered around physics or astronomy, so no, we're not going to talk about social clubs and things like that. And then um, we're also going to touch on what you can do as a career, depending on the options that you, you take and the different career options that the four of us are contemplating. So um, I think without further ado, we can kind of dive into it. So I personally am planning on double majoring in math and physics. I was, when I initially came in to Michigan, I was planning on majoring. I wasn't exactly sure between astronomy or physics. Um, I kind of settled for physics more by accident than by design. Um, and then the reason why I basically added on the math major is that if you are, are, if you are already majoring in physics, getting a degree in math is only four, four or five classes away. So it was, I thought it was worth it for me. It was the, the benefits outweighed the, the extra burden of taking the four or five extra classes. So that, yeah, that's kind of it for me. I can go next. Uh, I'm strictly a uh, astronomy astrophysics major um i consider physics but i don't know if i could just do the double there's some classes that i just don't want to take or just have to take at all um and in terms of just minoring uh i'm thinking of minoring in statistics right now i'm about to take my first course and after that that one we'll see where it goes but uh, it's probably likely that i get it just because it's a four or five course minor and it's not super heavy and it's very doable so I can I can go. Um, I intentionally going into college wanted to do astrophysics, um, so I was planning on just doing astronomy and astrophysics. Um, but talking to a professor back in my hometown, they said it was better if I double majored in physics and astronomy, um, just for more versatility later on. So um, I'm currently doing a double major in physics and astronomy. Yeah, I also came into college wanting to do just astronomy and astrophysics. Then I don't know if it was necessarily a professor that told me, but over the course of my first year, I learned that physics is a bit more applicable to more fields once you graduate mm -hmm. uh, in most circumstances. And so I wanted kind of that, that broader education leaving college instead of being more narrow minded that astronomy and astrophysics would provide. So I'm doing astronomy and physics. And then also, um, I have enough room to minor in something. And so I was deciding between German math, which is only a few more, as Joe said, the minor is even less, obviously, than the major. So only a couple, or three the extra classes. The math is one extra class, I think, effectively. Yeah. And then, um, two. And then I was thinking computer science, but I think that's going to be too many. And then I think right now I'm going to do climate and space. So that'll allow me to kind of get experience with uh, space instrumentation and get like see if that's something I'm interested in. So kind of the nice thing with all of these the aforementioned degrees and minors they're all pretty similar so in terms of the prerequisites and a lot of the background that you're you're getting in a lot of the core classes they're pretty they're pretty similar in, in a lot of ways so doing two and doing any two is usually not too taxing. So if you're doing astronomy, doing physics is not so many more classes. Same thing with, if you're doing physics, for example, doing either maths or astronomy is not too many more classes. 
Um, right. mm -hmm. So that that's pretty useful. And so in terms of, for example, astronomy and physics, the I think most people start off in the, their first semester at Michigan by taking an intro mechanics class, which is pretty much I think I would assume that that's standard in most universities across right. the world. Um, and so at Michigan, there's two options. There's physics 140 and physics 160. And so the three of us, Michael, I, myself, and Tommy took 160 and Sam took 140. Uh, 160 is the honors version, is the honors mechanics version. And it's more geared towards people who are planning on doing a physics Right. astronomy major right. whereas 140 is the class that's required for all ev nearly everyone in the college of engineering right. and in a lot of other degrees so you have way more people that take 140 than do 160. i mean yeah just to speak a little about that i didn't when i came into michigan i was very didn't really know much about any of the astronomy programs or just the physics courses about what pathway to take and so i think I did it service to myself by not taking physics 160 because because I didn't know about it. And so taking 140, it's not the end of the world. Obviously, if you take it, it's still a class where you learn about physics and it's still very much doable. I would just say in terms of the broader strokes of what you want to learn, that class is so much more tailored towards the engineering students where um, the, the, the depth of learning you get as, as well as like a professor that really cares about your learning experience. Not to say those preppers don't care, but they have to gear towards 100 and like 140 students, 200 students in each lecture. Right. Whereas a, an honors course tailors to what, maybe 50 or 60 or even lo less than that, where mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more personal and you can probably get more in depth and engaged learning. And so, mm -hmm. as, as so someone who had to go through the 140 and the larger strokes class, I would definitely recommend if you were interested in the physics and astronomy to take the honor level, honors level courses. Um, even though right. they might seem intimidating or just a little harder, I would say the education and the learning you get and the pay you get from that is will set you up a lot better for the courses you take after. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Sam in that the one benefit to being in an honors class, at least for physics, is that you're not only, you not only have a professor who is only teaching, say, between you know, 40 and 50 kids um, who's really good at the topic and teaching that subject specifically, but also you're surrounded by a bunch of classmates that are super passionate about physics and already know kind of what track they want to go on uh, in terms of their undergraduate major. And so that was, that was really motivating being surrounded by, I didn't know Joe at the time, but at least Tommy I knew. I made a bunch of my good friends that my first year, freshman year, uh, in right. physics 160. Yeah, and I know calling uh, phys 160 honors, like uh, the word honors might scare some people, but <clears throat> the, the main difference between 140 and 160 is that 160 um, is more based on like the the background and the the why the things um, behave the way they do. It's calculus-based. Yeah, it's calculus-based. Mm -hmm. um, oh, which what, it was personally hard for me because coming into college, I've, I've only taken AP Calc, like AB, um, and I decided I wanted to take Calc 1 because, you know, Calc 2 is obviously scary for um, any incoming freshman, but especially in Michigan um, with the reputation it has. So taking 160 um, was slightly harder, but it, it wasn't anything that's um, not possible. Yeah. I, I also, when, want I, to do it. when I came in, I had only experience with like algebra-based physics, nothing AP, and most of that class senior year right. was goofed off since you know, I was graduating mm -hmm. and I didn't really care much. Um, and I guess I paid for the paid the price for that in a sense. But it was also like being surrounded by a bunch of people who are interesting, helpful, and were always there to answer my questions. The professor was always there to answer the questions. And office hours, like that was super helpful. And one thing I really right. about 160, where it was a first name basis with the professor. Not to mention, it was just like the curves is all, it's a lot more lenient, I think, in a smaller course. Right. Because the larger courses are already set. They're going to be, you already know, you could go back to syllabus like X amount of years and look at it and just be the same in terms of like how the course is going to be graded. Um, what the curves are, if there are any, if any, because usually in courses that that large, you're not going to get much of a uh, sliding curve in terms of your grading skill. And so even just the grading wise, it, I feel like it's a lot easier to take a smaller course and excel more because I think there's a lot more room for making small mistakes. Wherever that right. Be. Cause they, they prioritize more like learning the contents. You could apply it to like harder problems rather than your grade. Exactly. I, I think it's fairly safe to say that taking the honors class, will not drop your grade compared to what you would have gotten had you taken the non-honors version. 
Right. Um, I think partly because n notably the curve is more lean, the, the, the grade distribution, so the number of A's versus B's versus C's versus fails they give in a class is more lenient in an honors class. But I think most importantly, uh, paramount to that, you have the fact that in the honors class, you're not only surrounded by interesting people, but you're kept, I think you're kept way more in the loop because the project, are, the projects and the homeworks and the problem sets are harder. So you have a tendency to work with other people and it kind of stays at the forefront of your mind. Whereas with, with some of the honor, with some of the non-honors classes, you, I think your people have a tendency to think, oh, this is fine. And because the problem sets are not so demanding and you might not be struggling so much or feel so engaged, you have a tendency to put it off and then not do so well. And at least in 160, I know for a fact that because the problem sets were hard precisely and because you had to work with other people and because they, in lecture, it was far more based on trying to explain why things are than just explaining that things are. So right. I think that that keeps it much more interesting. I, for example, um, in in physics, if you take the example of the, the pendulum, you know, in physics, you people learn, I think even in high school, that the time period of the oscillation of a pendulum is two pi square root L over G or something like that. And in, you know, I had, in high school, I'd learned that and I was always thinking, oh, this is strange. How come this is not dependent upon the angle? This is, that makes, I don't understand why the angle of the, the oscillation is independent of the angle. In physics 140, I think, for example, you just learned, yeah, that's the equation, that's it, like right. nothing else. Whereas in physics 160, you learned about the reason why you learned that actually that equation is just the result of, for example, the linearization of the, the sine term in the differential equation that models it. Right, like, so you learn, for example, why that equation only holds for small angles and things like that. And that's way more interesting. And I think if you're a physics person, you, it, at least you, you're thinking, huh, this is cool. I'm learning something that I wouldn't have learned in any other textbook that you know, anyone has been learning about since high school. Whereas I think in 140, you don't really get that. So you, I don't know, I, I, I think you don't feel as engaged and so your grade, even though it's probably a little bit easier on average, it, your grade won't be, won't be any different. Mm -hmm. Right. I, like, I have, oh, oh yeah. For, especially for like later classes, having that um, base understanding of going through the derivations with your professors, um, like fundamental, because then you can apply those type of things to much harder and more complex um, systems that you're going to do, you know, in your three or 400 level classes. Yeah. And so I yeah. had that experience, not in 160, but I had that experience in the winter semester of our freshman year, taking physics 240, so physics 2 uh, E and M. And I took the non honors, the non honors course right. 240 and versus 260. And it was basically just, uh, as Joe said, sometimes it seems easy. So the lectures seemed pretty straightforward. It seemed like what I understood from high school until the exams or the the quizzes, I think they were called. And those were very, very difficult. And Sam was also, not in my class, but in the same course. I didn't realize the honors courses existed until I was halfway through the winter semester taking Physics 240. And so, yeah. so I was a little burned at that 240 point. 240 was not a fun class to take. Um, mm. And I'm not sure exactly why I didn't take 260, but I should have. And I think also one thing that we haven't mentioned about 160 or 260 is that they have a computer uh, portion to it. And so mm. you, you do a lot of uh, coding in vPython or Python uh, about, uh, you basically simulate different phys physical situations. Right, and again, but don't let that- Very knowledgeable, right. or very, like, um, very important. Right, yeah, you know, like Python. Having, having to rewrite um, what you learn in class in Python is like very intuitive in how you, develop your key understanding to what you're learning in class because you can do all the problems you want, like even memorize the, the patterns you need to do for specific problems, but then having to um, make a project that applies whatever you learn in class in a different way um, can help you learn. And don't let like learning Python, you know, scare you. They, they, they go in with a base understanding that you haven't learned any Python uh, in 160. Mm -hmm. So like I, I never coded in my life. Um, and yeah, I found say, it very easy still. That's not to say you don't get that experience at 140, because there is a lab course, and I did do a little bit of vPython in right. the 141 lab course, but I doubt it was the same depth. 
Right, written. like and 160, one, some of our assignments were like turning in lab courses or like um, projects that we had to do yeah. and stuff. But also it was very, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It was like creative mode in Minecraft where like it's a free for like, mm-hmm. I felt like it wasn't a lab necessarily, the homework assignments where I had to do it this way and get this exact answer. I could right. kind of sit down at my desk for hours and just creatively figure out and structure my Python code to solve the problem. And it, it doesn't matter, it didn't matter how I got there as long as I got there in the end. And you could look at all different yeah. codes between different it, students and it'd all be different. It was very like tool based. So in, it, unlike the coding classes that if you take a coding class, they just check every single line of your code. And if they don't, if they're not happy with it, boom, they, they, Still, they really yeah. mess you over. Um, whereas in, in, at least in the physics classes, the way that they made us use the Python was very much in, with the idea that you can use computers to solve problems that are much harder or even impossible to solve analytically. And so, and I thought that was, that, that was one of my favorite things. One of my favorite components of the class was being able to model these situations that I couldn't analytically through pretty elementary Python, elementary use of Python. Mm-hmm. So I think just to move forward a little, um, Obviously, we are entering our third year now. This is going to be our third year at Michigan. And so what to kind of expect in terms of your beginner courses, in terms of if you're looking into a physics or an astronomy major, is if you haven't taken any of that AP, if you, haven't, if you don't have any AP credit coming in, there's like obviously physics 140 or 160, physics 260 to take the honor courses for mechanics and electromagnetism. And then in terms of math, if you haven't also taken the AP courses, there's calculus one and calculus two you have to take, um, right. as well as eventually three and then i believe if you go into both you have to take four as well correct yeah Yeah. 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 variable and differential equations which i think are both very doable um obviously if you can for those classes as well i would recommend honors courses because i think small there are tendencies for those math classes to be very large lectured and hard to learn as well and so i would Mm -hmm. say take smaller classes where you can learn Um, right like i I came into i came into 160 and you use um, quite a bit of Calc 2, um, but uh, I hadn't taken Calc 2 yet, and I was going to take it the next semester, but it wasn't anything that, like, um, you can't quickly figure out. It was, like, fundamental, you know, calculus, too. So even if you don't take any Calc in high school and you come in, um, just taking the, the most standard route, like, you're not going to have any problems. Yeah. Also, also I, I do know Hold that out. one thing we should mention is the college will accept, like, for AP exams, they'll accept a 4 or 5 for yes. AP. A B or B C calculus. You only skip calculus one though. Isn't that correct? Is that correct? Um, if you, you get a five, you can choose whatever you want. You yeah. can you when you at uh, the Michigan math department is pretty lenient. So they don't give you credit for having taken. They don't give you college credit for having taken the AP calculus exam. But you don't have to take. However, it. you can take. You can enter the math sequence at any point that you want. So if you tell them that you understand multivariable calculus and you only want to do differential equations, they're fine with that. Um, the, the only thing is that, that we should point out is that taking the honors version of the math classes, so taking the honors version of multivariable calculus, or the, taking the honors version of Calc 2 multivariable calculus and differential equations, is you are putting yourself in a very precarious position. Yeah, I'm right. They are really, really, really hard. Taking right. the honors math yes. classes is not like taking the honors physics classes, Perhaps. which is yes. just more interesting. Taking the honors math classes you, requires you first, like at heart, being a very hardcore mathematician because the homeworks are, the homeworks are notoriously long and hard and take the, at least 10 hours a week to do. And then they're famously very hard. They're famously graded harshly as well. And also there's not so much of a need to do that. I don't think taking the honors math class, unless you want to do a, be a pure mathematician, puts you in a better position for going down the line. I will say though, right. I did have a poor experience with calculus three. Oh, granted, it was probably Same. my fault with uh, what you yeah. saw before. However, yeah, I would say with those, I would say with the, the math portion, Michigan is somewhat known for having difficult math courses. Very. Um, yeah. I would say Calc one is Fully doable. Calc two is doable too. And mm. the good thing about what Michigan does is, for those first two calculus courses, they do break it up into smaller, smaller groups and smaller classroom settings, where you right. are paired with a teacher in a more high school 
number type, at least in terms of where right. we're in the class. We have like 30 kids in your class. Yeah, where the, the learning is right. more tailored towards you and that, that assists you a lot. But as soon as you move on from those classes to calculus three and calculus four, um, the classes do get a lot larger because it's a lot harder to pay education. So, right. And yeah, especially, I, say, I think personally, I don't know about y'all three, but Calc three was definitely way harder than Calc four. Calc three got revamped. So when, uh, when right. I took it, that was the last time it was n it was still following the old model and that was completely fine but when i saw but then the semester after me they ch they changed up the homework sets and I, I saw my roommates get it and they were at least three times longer than any homework set that i got and right. they were graded much more harshly and yeah i mean cal calculus three so multivariable calculus got immensely harder the semester after i took it i would yeah i would say very be careful with that uh it's it's, yeah. I, my like, only warning would be to not wait until last minute to study the past exams because mm -hmm. it's not going to help you that much. Um, definitely, right. uh, be very involved with lectures. And, and and this isn't this isn't the dog on like the the math department or anything like. No, it's, of course not. It's still very doable, but just know that um, the higher in math you get, the it, it scales exponentially and it gets a lot harder. Um, so be prepared to you know maybe schedule it um, with an easier class like. Um, I don't, I don't know, just an easier class that has a, a lighter course load. Yeah, well, that is not that too. swamp yourself down too much. There is something to be said about that, too. Um, I definitely think you are going to be having this pair of either physics or an astronomy course with a math course every semester. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think that's something out of the realm of possibility. And so if you are looking to minor in things, you might want to plan ahead in terms of your scheduling with your what courses to take. Say if you want to dabble in computer science, I would look to find spots where you know, you aren't taking three STEM courses, three, three science courses at the same time. Or right. if you are to look at what courses they are and to see, is this doable in my mind? Or look at the workload in, in terms of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's, it's not bad to skip out. I mean, you obviously want to, like, stay kind of on track, depending on how many courses um, are required. So I took physics every semester. But I didn't take astronomy every semester. And especially after you finish your math classes and some other prereqs, you'll have a lot mm -hmm. more space to take. Um, upper level courses that are going to be um, bigger projects and less busy work so you can take a uh, more of those um, classes that you may have missed out on you know your three or four hundred levels uh you waited off on you know take calc three or calc four yeah. and then to go over sophomore year quickly and so um as we have mentioned in a previous episode or as a, we mentioned in a previous episode we took astro 201 which mm -hmm. we, all four of us took together the winter semester of a freshman year. And so that's introductory to astrophysics. That's the prerequisite class for an astrophysics and astronomy major. It's the first course to take, right? Yes. Right. And then moving into sophomore year, um, that fall, the four of us took together physics yes. three, which is relativity, <laughs> thermodynamics, and waves. It's kind of a, a weird combination between the three, but it all fits together nicely. Um, what other classes we took? And of we took course, we took Astro 361 physics. as well, which is the right. next math course to take for astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, and then whatever math course we were, because we were all in different courses. I right. Think, like Joe came in and did like a higher level math, and I took like Calc 1 just because I was scared of Calc 2. Yeah. Um, and then this past winter, we are in uh, Physics 390 and Physics 391. Mm hmm. And so that's modern Ooh. physics. Yeah, so like okay, intro right. to quantum mechanics and you know atomic physics. So I think maybe we should clarify the um, so both physics and astronomy require you to take um, physics one physics physics one hundred something physics mm -hmm. two hundred something and right. physics three hundred something yes and, mm -hmm. and yep. twice um, and so that's mechanics E and M. Uh, thermodynamics and intro to modern physics on right. top of taking math through multivariate variable calculus and differential equations right. and then kind of from there physics and astronomy split off where once you've done your intro to modern physics which is physics 390 mm -hmm. um, physics makes you go down a separate track compared to right. astronomy mm. yes so Oh, um, and then, so astronomy also makes you take 201 um, before you can then go into the upper levels. But then once you're done with physics 390, you're into the upper levels. And so I think all majors make you take some required upper levels and then some elective upper levels. So right. I think to 
we can briefly talk about the physics upper levels that exist. Mm -hmm. So once you're done with physics 390, they make you take advanced mechanics, advanced ENM, <laughs> which is electro. You forgot and about one three hundred. Yeah, you forgot about the math for your physics. Three fifty one. Fifty one. Oh, right? that is true. Physics. That is yeah, the one course that deviates, I believe, until that point because um, astronomy does follow the same path as physics. Right. Up until like, up, up until you're four hundred levels, really. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the strange thing is that math, uh, the physics major makes you take. Physics 351, which is uh, math math methods or like the math that's often it's math for physicists. Mathematical. And math. they make you take that before you take um, advanced mechanics. Right. Which incidentally, it's astronomy also mechanics. requires you to take yeah. Or it, and astronomy also requires you to take intermediate mechanics, but without having taken uh, the 351, the math mm -hmm. class, which is a slight, which is a, an amusing quirk. Right, but right. also also and like. I talked to my advisor and basically asked if I could take 351 alongside um, intermediate mechanics, and he let me perfectly fine. So it's not like a yeah. super strong bottleneck. Absolutely not. I've, I've taken both 401 and 351 separately, so sequentially, sorry. And 351 is not so necessary to 401, to mechanics. I think the only nice thing is that you already get an introduction to Lagrangian mechanics in the math methods class, which you then get again in 401. So honestly, doing 351 before 401 is not super necessary. Right. I think 351 is useful for things like complex analysis and matrix methods, but that doesn't really show up in, in 401 mm -hmm. very much. Um, and then, so then physics makes you take intermediate mechanics, intermediate DNM. It makes you take statistical mechanics, and then it makes you take um, quantum mechanics one. And then you have to do the two elective classes in physics, and then and then look if sorry and if you're doing the honors physics major, then you have to take another two um, physics electives, and the physics electives are pretty wide ranging, and I think some of them are super cool, at least I think. Right. So yeah. the the so I'm doing the honors physics major, and of the four I'm, I'm planning to take are quantum mechanics two which is just more quantum mechanics. Gravitational physics, which is general relativity, because that's just awesome. Uh, I'm also planning on taking computational physics because I'm told, uh, I'm reliably informed that computers are now playing an important part of the modern world. <laughs> and, and I think that would be a good thing to know. And then for my fourth, I'm not entirely decided. There's a lot of options to choose from. Uh, quickly though, for example, there's um, int introduction to particle, there's uh, there's particle physics. Uh, there's a class on particle physics. There's a particle on electro. Uh, there's a class on electromagnetic uh, radiation. There's a class on public systems. There's optical. There's a class on biological physics. There's a class on right. state physics. You can, I mean, take your pick. I'm not. They're exactly called electives sure. for a reason, correct? Right, like yeah, that. That's yeah, that's where you specify like what you, you want like to go the into, right? Of and then the one thing also for the physics major is usually your senior year, you take your two upper level labs, 441 and 442. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the same kind of applies for astronomy. Like I know there, I have to take 402, which I think is stellar astronomy, stellar and then 406, which is computational, yeah. right? But then after that, you have like so many different electives that you can choose. I don't even think those things are no, and, and, and so for right. the astronomy major, once you take Astro 201, you usually would take Astro 361, which we took last mm -hmm. uh, fall semester. Then from there, you have a bunch of different options. We have two required classes, the first one being stellar astrophysics and uh, galaxies. Um, so basically what the name means, that's what they're about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, they also offer computational astrophysics, which the three of us, uh, Sam, Tommy, and myself, are taking this fall alongside stellar astrophysics you can also take a class on exoplanets um they offer a class out west in arizona known as astro 461 which is an operational astronomy class where you work on the mdm observatory that michigan has telescope time on so that's an interesting one month class next right uh, june I believe. for us it's coming up next this coming spring I believe. right and it, that actually counts as one of your electives as well i think yeah. i'm planning on doing and that. and then they also have uh, an upper level writing course for astronomy if you just major in astronomy where you can uh 
or you learn about writing grants proposals, uh, how to how to format research papers properly, and things similar to that. Yeah, and I'm now talking um, to my advisor because I'm a double major. I can take um, the physics upper level writing. It it would qualify both the same. You don't need to take both. Yeah, and so again, that's a one nice thing about whether you choose to be an astronomy major going to college or choose to be a physics major is that there's so much overlap not only in the prerequisite classes but also in the mm -hmm. upper level classes where instead of having to take two upper level uh, writing courses that are technically required for both majors separately if you take one for physics you don't have to take the one for astronomy and so it just becomes that much easier mm -hmm. and then um also to quickly dive into the how you can double major in physics and math um math makes you choose one of several options when you're majoring in it, in it. And one of the options is majoring in mathematical sciences, which still gets you a full, a regular math degree. But one of the options um, amongst the sub majors of mathematical physics is of mathematical sciences, sorry, is that you can take uh, math, that you, is that you can focus on mathematical physics. And so if you, so the math degree makes you take some elementary classes all the way through, and then they make you take options. And if you do go down the mathematical physics route, a lot of those electives that the math department requires can be taken as physics electives. So for example, if you take, so some of the classes that maths will count as a math classes, even though they're taken within the physics department, are physics 405, four which is uh, e &M. And then quantum two, uh, gravitational physics, and I believe there's another one that, that I'm missing out on. But essentially, if you then if you choose to make if you're already doing a physics major, doing a maths major is a couple more classes. So one in linear algebra, another one in, in differential equations, probably another one in probability and stats, and then another one, I think, in either analysis or combinatorics. And then I think there's maybe one more that you have to take um, out of a pile of options. But essentially, you're pretty close to being right. a major if you're, if you're already doing physics. Right. And essentially, kind of what we're getting at is like after, I mean, you have some freedom in your second year. But after um, your second year going into your, your third year and fourth year, you have a lot of freedom um, to kind of take whatever classes you feel like taking. Um, there may be some requirements, but mostly it's. Um, whatever you think is the most interesting, mm. but also other than classes, there's a lot of freedom to um, join different clubs and organizations that are on campus as well. Uh, yeah, mm. and while like the astronomy and I'd say at least astronomy, I don't know about physics, but astronomy field is still kind of small. I think Michigan is uh, a little unique in the way that we are we are lucky enough to have a pretty sure maybe size wise to other departments in the school it's small, but compared to other right. schools in the nation, I think it's pretty actually a pretty decent pretty size. Big, and, yeah. It's a pretty decent community where um, I believe Michael is a part of the Bain Club for Michigan Astronomy. It's SAS, I believe. Yes, the SAS Student right. Astronomical Society. Yeah, yes. and so I'd say the, the astronomy department at Michigan is small, but Michigan's unique where I don't know if it's because they have enough funding to do so, but they have, most schools you'd find a physic, a joint physics and astronomy yeah. or, uh, <laughs> departments, and you'd find students who graduate that say they study physics would say, you majored in on a degree certificate would say physics and astronomy. But at Michigan, right. they have two separate departments, the same building, but two separate departments, two separate majors, which I think mm -hmm. that's coming into Michigan. That was the one thing that really interested me, knowing that I could major in just in astronomy and take really unique specific courses such as galaxies, um, stellar astrophysics, computational right. astrophysics, and things along that, like that. Like that. Um, and like the department itself only graduates, I believe, between maybe 10 and 20 students every year. Yeah. It's, it's quite yeah, small. It's pretty small. And, and physics is a bit larger, but still physics is, you know, certainly not the largest major on campus. Right. Yeah. Um, far from it. But I, I've, I've found that community building is super important and, uh, and with the, within both departments and the undergraduate community there. And also they're mm -hmm. very, very inclusive. And so for example, this freshman year and sophomore year, uh, <laughs> I've been a part of Student Astronomical Society. And so we hold meetings every Wednesday. Every, every other Friday night, we have things called open houses where we uh, set up the planetarium on campus at Angel Hall, also the, the, the 0.4 meter telescope at the top of Angel Hall. And we have students come, undergraduates, graduates. We have people from the public come, it's free. 
Um, it's super engaging. And as long as the weather's clear, there's always a bunch of stuff to see. So it's been a lot of fun being part of that. Mm -hmm. club. The other thing is that mm, if, if you are listening to this and you are majoring in physics or astronomy or even maybe math, work with other people. Uh, I was, I was sure, slow man. to get, I was very slow to get on that bandwagon. I mean, I knew you guys for Astro 201 and mm -hmm. that, and then it took, it took me a full year to realize that problem sets are best done with other people and that not only are you killing yourself and wasting your, and being slower, <laughs> just being stuck on your own, you're probably actually learning less. Um, so it, whereas if you get, if you can work with other people, mm -hmm. you'll understand how their brain is solving and approaching problems and right. you get to bounce ideas off each other, you know, it, um, which, which I have been told this a thousand times when I, from the age of probably 16 and people said, Oh yeah, work with other people. You're going to learn a lot of stuff, bounce ideas off each other. That's not actually a joke. I thought it, uh, I, I never heeded right. their advice. And I wish I would have, because now that I'm, now that I've done it, I'm learning a lot more. And the other, the, probably the most important side effect of having, of knowing people in your classes and working with them is that they keep having that keeps you really, really on up to date with your classes, mm -hmm. make sure that you never fall behind and it keeps you engaged even when you're in class. Whereas if you're on your own, you might have, uh, you might have this uh, intrinsic desire to just skip classes or not do homework right. or just be lazy and do something not productive when you should be doing productive, mm -hmm. be, when you should be doing something productive. So that's yeah. a pretty important piece of advice. And who knows, maybe you can start a podcast with those people as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and I also understand though, outside of that, there is a social club for the physics department as well. I'm not too mm -hmm. familiar with the math, but I'm sure there's a lot of different things you can do with math, obviously. It's there is a ton of stuff with math. Um, not that I know any of it, but at least in physics, there's a society for physics students, not the society mm -hmm. for astro astronomy students called the SPS. And the SPS has weekly or bi-weekly, and by bi-weekly, I mean every two weeks, not twice a week, um, meetings where they usually in have pizza, which is actually pretty good. And right. it's free dinner. So if you're hungry, that's a great place to go. And they usually have a professor who comes to talk about their research. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty interesting. We've had some pretty interesting talks, not only on the, the research side, but some, prof I mean, depending on the professors, but some of them give focus a lot more of their time um, on talking about how they became professors and the difficulties of going down the full academic route, um, kind of what it's like, how it affects your life, the choices you have to make to become mm -hmm. a professor as opposed to branching off and leaving science at whatever level you want to do that so that's pretty interesting yeah. and then the SPS doesn't hold ob observation nights but they do do something they do for example um, so not all the time but most of the time they try to go uh, to a local high school and work with a team of physics people to prepare for physics olympiads and they do quite a few outreach events and hold conferences um, so I mean there's there's quite a bit of stuff to do in in those clubs and then obviously a huge aspect of, well, a huge, uh, well, a big part of being an undergrad is jumping on the undergrad research hype train, mm -hmm. which I think the four of us ha have at this point, which is something that I think nearly everyone who's going to study physics or astronomy hears about before they go to college. And it's this whole big mysterious thing that people get all excited about, but I've, it's kind of uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about within within undergraduate research. Right. Like I feel like we can start off like how we got involved in our research, um, and I can kind of start that. Uh, Michigan is lucky enough to offer this program called the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program or Europe. Um, and you know, obviously, like Joe said, coming from high school, like I was told, research is important. You should get involved in research um, ASAP. It looks good on your resume and it gives you like super useful skills. Um, so I decided to apply for Europe and I got in um, and they basically, instead of leaving you on your own, they kind of walk you through all the steps, um, not only to, you know, apply for research and how to do research, but also to make resumes and write cover letters um, and present yourself and how to do interviews and how to give speeches and stuff like that. So it's a lot of 
um, professional useful skills that um, most classes and most high schools don't really teach. Um, so doing your op got me into my research program that I've been doing since October of my first year. Um, I continue it over the summer because I got lucky enough to be able to do it remotely through my computer. Um, but just having that program really helped me get into my research. And now um, I'm getting, you know, invitations to apply for fellowships, um, which I'm actually doing this summer. Um, so not only does it look good, but it also gives you a lot of skills and a lot of opportunities um, having these communities that you might not otherwise find. Yeah. And so I was not accepted into your app and a lot of kids aren't. And I was not discouraged. I was up, I was upset. But instead, what I did is I scoured through the astronomy and physics pages, like all the faculty. I read through a bunch of papers, and I ended up coming across this one guy who I work with now. Um, and he, like earlier that year, came across this really interesting uh, discovery about uh, the Andromeda galaxy, along with another professor that worked at Michigan. And that was I read through it. This was sometime maybe in June, going into freshman year, or July. I read through it. I tried to make sense of it. Research papers are difficult to read. So at that time, I had, much of it was over my head. And I sent him an email. Um, he never replied. Like, I, I sent him an email No, because I knew that I wanted to do research, even if it wasn't through your, I just wanted to do something. Right. Um, and so he didn't reply to my email. Um, but oddly enough, first day, my, I had gone to Michigan to move in freshman year. And my parents had never seen the campus before. The first thing I wanted to show them was the astronomy department. So I brought them through the halls of the astronomy department in West Hall. And we were you know, just about done, headed towards the elevator. And all of a sudden, this professor walks out of the room and is like, you guys need help? Are you guys lost? Because here's this you know, freshman kid with his two parents walking in the halls of the astronomy department. Right. Turns out that was the prof professor I emailed. Uh, he was like, what's your name? I was like, Michael. He was like, hey, are you that kid that emailed me over the summer? I would love to work with you and do research. And it was a super weird coincidence that that happened. Um, but I've been working with them ever since. Right. And um, even though I'm not doing Europe, and I'm not sure what it's like to be in Europe, I mean, the, the, the experience I've had being able to research under him and other, prof other professors who research similar things <laughs> and other undergraduate students and our research team has been very, very invaluable. Right. Like, I know, I don't know how Joe and Sam got the research, but I know one of the main things that highlighted in Europe is that if you were in Europe, you basically just cold email a bunch of professors about wanting to do their research and like specify like why you're interested in their research um, and what you can provide because what's the worst they can do is not answer you. Um, and then you can always, you know, if they don't answer you, always follow, a, you know, send a follow-up email, you know, two weeks later, still showing interest because professors love um, that you still show interest in the project even after um, they might not necessarily get to you the first time. So for me, I actually got on the research train pretty late. I was nearly halfway through sophomore year. And everyone was saying, oh, yeah, I do this research. It's so great. And so I was saying, huh, I should really do this. It seems very exciting. It seems uh, interesting. Everyone is saying that it's great. Uh, I'll be learning a lot, so I should do this. And I went to a talk, actually, by SPF, where uh, a professor was presenting her research on solid-state physics optics. And so I was thinking, well, this is actually, this is kind of cool. Um, I'll send her an email, ask her if I can, you know, work and work on her, her research project and, you know, join her lab group. And she got back to me. Uh, I met with her and she said, yep, absolutely. So now I, so for the last maybe eight months, actually, bit, yeah, eight months, I've been working on her research team. And it's been, it's been interesting. It's been ups and downs. Um, I, I would say, at least in my experience, it's not all of the hype that it's made out to be because people saying, yeah, you're going to do this research. It's super cool. You're going to know so many things. It's like being freaking Albert Einstein. You know, you're going to discover something. Right. And it's really not like that at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, yeah, I'm not, not to say that it's not interesting or valuable because it is interesting. And I, th and I, I definitely learned a lot of stuff. Uh, both working with her grad students, the grad students on her team, um, and spending time in the lab, learning how new things work, learning how pieces of instrument, you know, instrumentation work. So that that's all been very interesting. For example, I've had way more experience now reading research papers, so I'm a lot better at it. I understand what's going on much more of the time. However, there is this 
there is obviously this thing where we are 20 and they are not and we are under ads and they are not either and a lot of the stuff they do is just way over ahead right. and there's no there's no earthly way unless unless you are like endowed by genius. nature with right. with some intellectual gifts that are just unpa- extremely rare i would assume there's no way that you can make up for that many that m- not only the fact that they're really smart people who've been working on this particular problem for a really long time <laughs> But there's no way that you can make up for, for example, not having taken all of these graduate classes that all of mm-hmm. them have. And so even though it's been really interesting, I've learned a lot. I've, I've, I've learned a lot about not only how research, you know, I've, not, I've learned a lot about, I've learned physics, but I've also learned how physics is done, the ways that they, they go about making the lab work and things like that. I haven't, on the other hand, made any significant discovery, far from it. And I do, you know, all the time that I'm there, I'm thinking, huh, it would be really, really handy if I knew graduate level quantum mechanics. And it would be really, really handy if I had studied Jackson as opposed to not even having taken undergrad e So there is definitely this thing where going into research with a mindset that it's going to be really cool because you're going to discover something fundamental and you're going to work on super cutting edge stuff. If that's your mindset going in, you need to get pretty lucky and work really hard and be really smart to get that outcome. I think for most people, the people that I've talked to, and I think for myself, the, the things that you get the most out of doing undergraduate research is working in a team with other scientists, working, learning how to pick new skills up pretty fast. Right. So, for example, learning how to make a, some kind of piece of instrumentation work, uh, how to make it work well enough mm-hmm. to fit your purposes, how to how to do all of these things. And then also very importantly, you get to know whether you like doing research and if you want to keep going on and doing it into grad school, which, for example, I think that I have now learned that I'm not passionate enough uh, I and this, this might this is this might change as the years go on, but as of now, I don't think I'm a passion I'm passionate enough about solid state physics or experimental physics to want to go do it for a career. Um, having said that, I'm not saying that there's no place for physics after I leave undergraduate, but I that it that has been another interesting thing is that it kind of teaches you what you like doing and what you don't doing like doing. And for me, I know that I prefer more the kind of theoretical physics aspect than the experimental physics aspect. Yeah, I think that is something that, that is worth to bring up. I think when you get into research, um, you have to have, to have an open mind. Uh, I think that's why when people emphasize you want to get into it as soon as possible, I think not only just for your resume and just for those things, but I think just to you know, get rooted in one area of research and to thoroughly enjoy it and thoroughly create, like, I think the earlier you get into it, and the longer you do it, the more you'll understand, the more you'll enjoy it more. And as time goes on, you'll, things will start to click. We'll be like, oh, okay, I can see patterns with how things work now. And, mm-hmm. and I think it becomes an overall more enjoyable experience. Um, as for me and how I got into research, I think there's something we forgot to mention with the courses. But the astronomy department at Michigan, I think I'm lucky enough to uh, where um, they do require that you take, you do introductory research. And there's actually a course at Michigan that offers called Astro 399, where it is an intro to research where for a year or for how many semesters or whatever, you are paired with professor and you go and do research with them. And so for me, uh, this past year, sophomore year, I took 399 for both the fall and the winter. And uh, yeah, I studied black hole, like uh, something to do with uh, the X-ray emissions from the Swift, Swift mission that would help you kind of look at uh, the different data from there and the different the readings from those instruments and kind of coding to see, okay, what is this a black hole or like these kinds of things. And so... That experience, I think, I was initially pretty excited to get into it, but after just going through it, I just realized there's a lot of, oh, wow, I just, I'm completely out of my depth here, first and foremost. Right. Like, there's a lot where my knowledge is just so lacking, and so it's definitely a harder transition. And while I do think it was a valuable experience, I do think it was something where I realized that, oh, maybe this is something that I don't want to do, um, mm-hmm. and there might be a different research project that I could join. Right, like typically? I, I, want to, I want to learn from more. Um, Research yeah, right. has definitely been my biggest ego check in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, for I, sure. Because 
I mean, in high school, I did not really struggle much. I mean, a little bit from time to time, but I had nothing I couldn't get over. And then even in prizes admission, I've always done well. I've done a pretty good job. Right, like, like as long as you try, you'll be bed. fine. And then, you know, I, I'd always done pretty well. I thought, huh, I'm, I, you know, I'm pretty good at this physics thing. Um, I, I kind of like it, you know. And then I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'm totally going to go down the PhD route. I'm going to, yeah, I never planned on becoming a professor, but I was thinking, well, I'm going to be really good at physics. I'm not quite like Einstein, but like, you know, nearly. Right, right. And then I get into research and I'm like, oh my God, I am not only am I so out of my depth, but all of these people are super smart. They're all super hardworking. They've all worked really hard for a really long time. And I am just, I'm just totally useless. Yeah, but I mean, and also, I think on the other side, Joe, like, certainly the professor I work with and the graduate student I work with are extremely smart. They're also professors and graduate students. Mm, and right. often, I think at first, maybe I got discouraged. But more now than before, I, I'm, if anything, inspired by them. And seeing how hard they work and how much they know and their expertise and all they've gone through to understand and be at the top of their field. And so I, I don't think, like, sure, it's a bit intimidating and you know that there's going to be a lot of work between you and them. But I think it's also very, you know, enlightening, inspiring. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. Right. Say when I say ego check, I'm not saying don't do it because it'll just make you sad and unhappy. I think it just, it kind of puts you back into uh, context of where you are when you're 20. And right. it, makes, it makes you realize that if you want to go to the next level, you have to work for it, and it's not just given out to you. Right. And yeah, yeah. If you, and if you want to be there, you really have to want it. That is to say, like, I think I was lucky enough where I still have professors who, even though I would, like, vocalize, you know, I, I feel like I don't know anything or, like, I feel like I'm really not understanding much here, they would they, they'd come back and say, no, 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 it's okay. It's, we understand. We've been where you've been. Like they right. would kind of relate with me and say, you know, this stuff takes time. So just keep at it, keep reading papers, keep trying. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, one day, like it'll, it'll get better. And so I think I was lucky enough to have professors who, and I think most professors will be like this in research because they understand that we are also undergraduates, you know, we are, right. going through, we are in our, most of us would be in our so second, second year, second, third years where mm -hmm. our knowledge is still lacking sufficiently, but they were kind enough and lenient enough and understanding enough to know that, you know, we do, only have a little bit of knowledge, but they're, they want to work with us and they want us to learn as well. And so I think you know, it's, it's good to know that you're not going to know, you're definitely not going to know anything, first of all, and it's going to be a learning process to understand how things work, but your right. professor's there for a reason and you're doing research with, research with them for a reason. So it's a really good way to, you know, they're, right. they're going to be there to help you and guide you in a sense, not, right, show right. You, not like give you all the answers, but to like kind of push mm -hmm. you in the ways that they want to see you grow and uh, help fill in those gaps when it's needed you know right and like the uh, professors will always like push you to go forward and like obviously like the end goal is always to look forward but if you look backwards we've also learned a lot of stuff like we've learned how to solve you know circuitry um how to solve for the waves that control everything that happens in the universe um, so it is very easy to get caught up um looking forward and thinking um that there's so much to learn but then doing research, you also learn so much. And especially, I know it's a misconception that people will in research sit there and then write on chalkboards some like super fancy equations. But a lot of the times undergraduate research involves um, analyzing the data that's already been collected and being that's able to what it is. Like code to run. Yeah, like it, it's, it's applying skills that you know to help solve a bigger problem so that, you know, when eventually you get there, you're comfortable enough to be able to um, do it yourself, maybe even hire undergraduates to do it for you um, and, you know, continue the process. Mm -hmm. But it, it's easy to get caught looking forward and not realize, you know, how far you yeah, go. Yeah, it's, it's just a rabbit hole. You, mm -hmm. you get, you make one step and then you realize that there's still two more steps to go. Right. And then you make those two steps and you're thinking, whoa, I'm so much smarter than I was three days ago. And then there's four more steps to go. The, uh, the other cool, the, one of the cool things with research though is that it, it's made me, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting life experience. It's an interesting work experience, but it also makes you way better at your classes. So I had, because you're, you're kind of figuring things out on the fly and you're learning concepts before you maybe learn about them in class. So for example, before we got into the modern physics class, I, had, I knew most of that stuff from just having read about it. 
doing my research. So obviously I hadn't spent a lot of time doing do, solving problems in the textbooks and things like that, but I already knew a substantial part of it, which was kind of cool. Yeah, right. uh, I think research is definitely a good thing to get into, at least try out. I, I think it definitely helps. Uh, but also, to boost your research or your resume, stuff like this, but just for I, knowledge, I think it's great. I think um, with, with research, it's very important along the process to, to ask whether or not you like it and to ask that question very often. Because the one thing about research in my perspective, or with my research experience, is that I've loved it. And I study galaxy evolution, so how galaxies interact with each other. And I like everything I do about my research, except moving forward in not only undergraduate, graduate in my career path. Um, if I continue to love it, there may be a time when I don't like it. And I'll never have the experience to study what Joe's studying or study what Sam's studying or Tom's studying, study right. something physics, study exoplanets. And so I think it's important to ask whether you like it. I like love it. it enough to make a career out of it. Or right. it'll, it, it'll introduce you to different career options that you can explore before you actually get there and then find out you don't actually like it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, maybe we can talk a bit now about career paths. Um, but I think for, for myself, um, when I went into school or undergraduate, I wanted, to, as I said before, I wanted to study just astronomy. Now I'm studying physics and astronomy. So physics mm -hmm. Uh, provides a bit more breadth in terms of what you can nice. go into afterwards. You don't necessarily need to you know, go on the PhD uh, mm -hmm. path and graduate and become a professor, but certainly right. not still. Like the, the skills you learn in the physics department don't only specifically apply to physics. You could go, um, I'm sure there, there will be like small things that you can learn, but having the, the base foundation to, you know, work a statistics or a math job, um, or, yeah. you know, I think in banks and stuff. Yeah, I, I think Sam's perspective is quite interesting because he's doing astronomy, but he's also doing statistics. Right. And yeah, and I mean, to get into a little bit of that, it's, I do enjoy astronomy. I did come in wanting to do astronomy, but I'm realizing now that I'm going into my third year, I don't know if I want to continue to do education, continue to receive education for X amount of years uh, after college. Um, I do think right. there's merit in at least keeping my options open in terms of what I can do after school, whether it be grad school, obviously I don't know now. Um, this is something that we'll have to eventually come to, but um, that's why I wanted to get into statistics, just because I think, I believe, strongly believe that astronomy pairs really well, just as a way of physics, it would pair really well physics and math, you know, those kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of what you do with astronomy is big data, big numbers. You learn a lot about, I think, just basic, even in all your courses, you learn about basic statistics, like all those different things. And so uh, I think they pair really well. and. It gives you a leeway into things such as like, you know, data science, information science, right. uh, statistics, you know, just a lot of these things that are, I believe today are just so useful. And they yeah, they're used everywhere. Jobs. Yeah, they're used everywhere. And mm -hmm. so um, definitely in terms of opening my career path options, I think for me, it's something that I want to get, kind of get into just because I do think I enjoy working with numbers to a certain extent. And so um, it's, it definitely keeps my options open and doesn't pigeonhole me into just having to, oh no, I have to go to grad school. Like this is my right, only option. Yeah. And yeah, there's nothing else that I can do outside of grad school because who wants someone with an astronomy major, you know? And so, mm -hmm. uh, in in my case, actually, I I don't know how much I like numbers. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like math and I find it really interesting, and I like, but I don't like math and physics and things like that just by, for the fact that there's numbers there. What what I like about it is more problem plus solution. Yeah. Pro problem plus finding the solution through putting other stuff that you know together yeah. and um for example i've realized that i one of the i mean i came into university thinking that i had no idea what i was going to do as a career then through my first year and a half of university class i was like hmm, definitely going to do a physics phd and then now i'm thinking huh, maybe maybe there's other things that i like doing and there absolutely are. And I don't even know that I want to go into the career of being some kind of number crunching person. I think it's always good to know numbers, but I'm not even necessarily considering a career in the quantitative field. I mean, perhaps finance or something like that, but even then I don't know that I want to do only the, the simulation mathematical aspect of it. There's <sighs> lots of things that I like doing. And one of the cool things I think with studying physics or math or astronomy is that you go through the intellectual rigor of asking yourself, I know this, in which case is this true? What, you know, are there edge cases where this doesn't hold up? How can I pile my knowledge together? How can I learn? How can I read quicker? 
And I think because of the enormously rigorous nature of these subjects, you learn to think in a really, I think people talk about critical, critical thinking, but I think you learn to think in a, in a, you learn to think in a perhaps unusual way where you, I think in a more hypothesis kind of base world, which a lot of other people don't think in. And so I, I, that's pretty cool. The only thing is that um, I think if you're studying physics and or astronomy or math, people say, oh yeah, it's great. You can go into all of these other fields. However, no one is, go very few people are going to look for you unless you make the effort of making yourself kind of Appliable. interesting in those, right. in those other fields. So mm -hmm. for example, if you're, I'm considering a career in investment banking or finance or something like that, or I mean, let's just say a particular physics student is considering a career in investment banking, then um, if he only goes down the physics track without trying to do, to learn other things or trying to find opportunities in investment banking without trying to read and you know read the news read the read finance things read investment banking things know things about investment banking you can't successfully make the transition it's an it's i don't think it's given to you whereas i think if, for example if you study business you're obviously going to go into a business related field and your your career right. ready. doing physics or astronomy or math does not make you career ready it makes you thinking ready but then you still have to make the effort of learning all of the things about that field, which is, I think, a unique constraint of doing a very non-pre-professional thing. Um, right. You you do have to make a bit of an effort if you want to reach out. But I do think there's something you said with both physics and astronomy, regardless of if you double major or if you do one major in any any of them, like they have enough room where you can supplement your education with other things to actually build and be right. ready. I think there's something, yeah, because I think the astronomy major, like, exactly. I, I mean, I'm be wrong with this. Like 42 minimum required credits to, credits to graduate, which is, I think, is it 42? I believe it's Sometimes, 42. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around there where it's, it's very low. And granted, you do have to like take it all four years because they, your classes build off each other. And so, mm -hmm. so they get more advanced as you go. But there's so much more room for you to fill in with whatever you want, where, whether it be like math, you know, you right. want to go to computer science. There's a lot of things where you can fill in. And it's, I think you do learn a lot of the rigors of problem solving, but that doesn't mean you're pigeonholed into just astronomy when you get into it. I think the reason why I'm able to even try out, you know, statistics and I, I cause I even tried out computer science, you know, I took a couple like a course in that, like mm -hmm. there's a lot of breathing room with the astronomy major where you can try courses and you can right. get into other fields and like get, get more experience with other career fields where you could apply exactly. what you learned from astronomy into that. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. I tried like, computer science and I, hated the was, intro computer science class yeah. with a passion. I don't think, I think that that has been and will be the single worst class I've taken in <laughs> college. Not, not because of the way that it was taught or the people. Yeah, it's just, it. They were actually pretty it's, comfortable it's just, what they were doing. It. It's, it's for a specific of type of person. Class. It's just that in, when I think coding and things like that, what, what my image of coding going into that class was you use coding to do simulations and analyze stuff and use the power of computers to make your life a little bit easier. When I went into that class, it was design a game of rock, paper, scissors and battleship. And I was thinking, I cannot believe that I'm wasting my time learning how, right. for example, you manipulate strings and you check in input data and you return to the user, whether his input was right or wrong. I, I hated that so much. Whereas but, it's really weird. You think that a project in coding battleship would not be too different from a project in doing physics with coding, mm -hmm. but it really was. And the right. cool thing is that that definitely turned me away from going to, going into a career that's too computer driven. Right. Like you have the freedom to try out different things and you tried out computer mm -hmm. science and found out you didn't like it. Like uh, I know a doctor who majored in chemistry and physics and then went on to go be a chiropractor and you you know, typically you think, oh, you should do like movement science or kinesiology if you want to go to med school to be a chiropractor. But he was a chem and physics major um, and that got him into med school. And, you know, now he's a doctor doing chiropractor and, you know, physical science. So, yeah, yeah, so I mean, I think it is to say there's the education route with all these things. Of course, mm -hmm. astronomy you can go into education, physics you can go into, like there's all, I think 
it is. If you're serious about the education field, then yeah, PhD is probably the final destination for that. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I think when I talk to most people in the department, it's you know it's either PhD or you just you know you just, you were undergrad and you graduated and you didn't get right. into the academia field. Um, but there are different options for career pathways. I think mm-hmm. that has been clear, and I think it's up to you whether what you want to supplement your education with if you're going into a physics or astronomy degree. Um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I hope you guys learned something. Um, and as always, please like and subscribe, follow us. <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll see you next week with a different topic. And the other thing is to a great place to learn about what classes are required for what majors and how they overlap are at the department websites, where they list there in great detail exactly what classes you have to yes. take and what options you have right. and how to do it. Sometimes it's a pain to understand how the classes that are required for math overlap with the classes that are required for physics with, that are in themselves overlapping with astronomy. So that can be a bit of an intellectual juggling exercise, but yeah. it's a good place and, to go. We'll and if you're a bias. student listening to this at Michigan, uh, the advisors at Michigan are very accessible. So you can always make right. with them. You can always talk to other undergraduate students. Or again, if you're at Michigan and you see us on campus, feel free to ask us any questions you may have. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Yep. See ya.